Okay, so welcome to all of you uh, for the first lecture of this semester. Uh, I'm of course very happy and very proud to be able to bring uh, Edward Moser here. You may know that he was uh, supposed to give a lecture yesterday with his wife and collaborator uh, and co-director together, but uh, because of the un impossible weather in Europe, they missed the plane and they got stuck in Europe, but apparently they arrived this morning, so this is already on its, on its own quite a success uh, to bring Edward here. Uh, so we missed one lecture, but at least we have this one, and uh, I'm sure you will enjoy it. I was, I was trying to think of one word that will uh, try to capture, which is of course impossible, Edward, and I think that m my word is really, he is a phenomenon. <laughs> He's a young phenomenon, uh, 47 years old, and this young phenomenon already has two cells that he found in the brain. I'm sure you all heard about the grid cells, but he also, so this is a nature paper from 2005, but there is also a new type of cell, the border cells. It's a recent paper in science, so I don't think that I know anybody with two cells, types, found by him. So grid cells and border cells uh, by this Moser's group. So this is the phenomenon, but also when you look at the, the publications, it's really quite amazing to see, I mean, really, I don't know how, how, how maybe he will explain how he does it, but uh, I mean, uh, every few months a paper in Nature or Science or Nature Neuroscience or PNAS, uh, a real phenomena, it's, it's really something we, we can learn from. Apparently it does good science, we should hear about that soon. <coughs> And just a few a few words about the history, so you know already when he was born, 62, actually it's 48. Uh, he did his PhD with Peer Andersen. Peer Andersen is a very well-known scientist, in, in, or hippocampal scientist in, in Norway. Uh, I know him personally, so I didn't know that uh, he was doing his PhD there with Peer Andersen, so this is a very good start. But you can see from his CV, other very good continuation. So a postdoc with uh, O'Keefe. O'Keefe was the one who found the place cells, so maybe it is a continuation of finding cells. Uh, so place cells were found in 1971 by John O'Keefe. Uh, later on he was working with Richard Mor Morris, uh, you all know Richard Mor Morris, I'm sure, from the Morris Maze. And since 19, uh, 2002, they are both, uh, Maybrit and, and Edward are, are in Norway, uh, they, they had this center, center for Biology of Memory, and also they have an, another institute, which is very prestigious, I don't know if you know, the Kavli Institute. There are several Kavli Institutes in the world, uh, very few in neuroscience, I think maybe two in neuroscience. We hope to be the third in neuroscience, the Kavli Institute. Many prizes, you know, member here and member there, I'm not going to embarrass him more, but I just want to finish with, with, with something I found in the internet, which we like a lot here, and I think there is already a connection between the ICNC and their institute in Norway. So I saw that there was a recent seminar in the Kavli Institute, in the center in Norway. It's called the Brain and Musical Improvisation. What goes in the brain during musical improvisations? Are there differences in the brain activity when a musician plays a written music compared to improvising? Im 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 improvising? Does improvisation have something in common with the adaptive consciousness? Using an old bass and baritone saxophone, two names that I don't know, uh, artists, will illustrate their talk with music and will discuss improvisations as a phenomenon and its potential in different contexts. I don't know, Edward, if you know, but we recently had a course on brain and music here, so I find a very interesting co 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 collaboration or interest between the two institutes. Thank you very much for coming. We are going to invite you for a little bit of an official ceremony because we are doing it to all our Heller lectures. So the head of the ICNC, Tali Tishvi, and myself are going to give you a present. So you are right. invited. <laughs> so this is the present. It's a little bit of a... All right, so as you all know, uh, the Heller lecture series is a, a special distinguished lecture series that the ICNC is... is, is uh, directing and heading for many years now, uh, where we have four talks of the best neuroscientists we can find in the world uh, every year. And uh, 
we are required and honored to officially give you this uh, award, this certificate of recognition and appreciation to Edward Moser for his contribution to ac academic inquiry and exchange at the Interdisciplinary Center for Neurocomputation at the Edmund Safra campus in Givat Ram. And uh, I'm sure that you especially fit perfectly in the interdisciplinary spirit of the center, and we hope to see you more often here. So okay, thank you. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Welcome to Tani, the new head of the ITNC. <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? Is the microphone on? It's on? Okay. All right, and then the lights. Oh, okay, that's perfect. Okay. So, uh, first of all, thanks to my uh, host for uh, inviting me to uh, come here. It's a great pleasure because uh, this is one of the places in the world that has really formed uh, the field I am uh, working in. So, I think um, the combination of, uh, of theoretical uh, physics, computational neuroscience, and experimental neuroscience is, uh, uh, is perhaps one of the most powerful ways to drive our field forward. And I think there are not many other places in the world where this has happened so successfully as here at uh, Hebrew University. So it's a great pleasure to be here, and uh, I... Uh, I'm proud that you have put me up on uh, this list of uh, speakers in the Heller Lecture Series, which I uh, looked at the list and uh, uh, it was uh, really a lot of uh, good names. So, thanks for inviting me. So, what I'm going to talk about today is how the brain navigates in space. That is something uh, Edan actually modified my title a little bit, probably to attract the physicists come to, because uh, you probably all have seen the, the announcement which uh, shows a grid cell which is flying like uh, Earth in outer space or something like that. So I uh, like that one uh, as well, and I hope that uh, I can get a copy of it, uh, Edan. So I'm, go however, going to... Inside there. Mm -hmm. oh, it's inside, oh, fantastic. Oh, let's see. Ah, yeah, <laughs> that's the one. <laughs> but uh, um, um, now I'm going to try to get us down to the earth. So uh, we'll begin uh, in the desert. And the question I'm going to ask is, how uh, is the brain computing our own position? How do we know where we are in the environment? And, uh, uh, most of us perhaps think that uh, to do that, we use the landmarks around us, like pictures on the wall, doors, blackboard, whiteboard, and so on. But uh, actually, it turns out, and you know by yourself, that uh, for short distances, you can actually find your way, uh, even without really using any landmarks, like in the desert, where there's nothing useful uh, to, uh, to keep... Uh, to, to help you to uh, navigate around. So for short whiles, you can still go several meters uh, uh, straight here and then go to the left. And uh, when asked to go back, you'll manage to navigate more or less back to where you started. So clearly, this shows that navigation uh, has more than just using landmarks. Actually, also uh, a metric system that I'm going to talk more about today. So I will try to um, suggest um, uh, some components of this system that might help our brain maintain and update uh, a representation of our own position in the environment. I will ask how this is uh, develops uh, in, uh, in, uh, during ontogenesis of the nervous system. And I will also uh, talk about the relationship to storage of such memories. So, um, the history of uh, spatial navigation and spatial memory can at least be traced back to Edward Tolman at Berkeley, who in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s did important work on uh, the ways that uh, animals, primarily rats, navigated in uh, small experimental environments. So, he let his... Uh, rats navigate around in various types of mazes uh, 
And based on these experiments, for example, in what he called a sunburst maze, the rats were trained to, on many trials, to walk straight here and then find a food there. And then the cri critical intervention here was to open all the arms in the end. And what he showed mm -hmm. was that uh, rats were able then to take a detour, the shortcut, to take a shortcut from the starting point to uh, the goal. And why is this important? Sounds pretty trivial, but actually at that time it was very important because uh, uh, psychologists, behaviorists at that time thought of behavior as sequences of stimuli and responses that are linked in, in long chains. And what he suggested from his experiments is that instead the brain actually forms a kind of map of uh, the rat's position in the environment, which uh, also encodes relationships between places that the rats has never moved between before. So he called that a cognitive map. Uh, and that was a map of the rat's space, but a map that also contained the experiences that the animal made in that environment. So it was a map plus things that were in the environment, experiences that it made in the environment. Therefore, he called it a cognitive map rather than a spatial map. So this uh, uh, work was important, but at that time uh, it wasn't easy to say much about what was going on in the brain. And uh, the reason were at least twofold. First, there was a lack of uh, concepts. And this changed um, during the subsequent years. So one of the most important uh, uh, changes was uh, Donald Hebb's work. Uh, and especially his book, The Organization of Behavior, which came in 1949, where he introduced uh, uh, the concept of cell assemblies and the role, potential role of uh, plasticity uh, between cells in maintaining and creating such cell assemblies. So the idea of the, the fact that someone started to dare to talk about, to think about how could complex phenomena like uh, thoughts ideas, memories, be stored in the brain. Uh, and the fact that that was related to interrelationships between <coughs> cells was quite important in my view. And then things uh, developed further. We got uh, Marr, we got uh, Hopfield, and not the least the work that came at the end of the 1980s here from the Hebrew University with uh, Amit Gutfreund and Sompolinsky which uh, really introduced uh, a different way of thinking about network, uh, introduced attractor dynamics uh, and ideas from statistical physics, which really changed the way that neuroscientists are now thinking about uh, phenomena like memory. So that was the one change. But the other change that happened was uh, the introduction of new experimental tools, and not the least the microelectrode, which made it possible to record in behaving, or at least awake animals, to record from single neurons in the brain while animals were performing things. And performing things meant at that time primarily uh, sensory behavior. So Jubel and Wiesel's work you all are familiar with, which was uh, also revolutionary uh, in its own way. And, uh, was followed by a lot of work until we came to John O'Keefe, who in 1971, as Idan said, discovered place cells. So at that time, he also used uh, these microelectrodes, navigated them down to the hippocampus, and as far as I understood, didn't really expect anything, uh, expect to find any spatial cells, but did uh, actually happen to find these place cells. So this uh, can illustrate, illustrate the idea. This is a microelectrode inserted into the brain. Here's, uh, let's say, a pyramidal cell in the hippocampus. And uh, this electrode is able to pick up uh, extracellularly action potentials from the cell. These signals are then uh, going now to a computer, and they are stored. And uh, uh, one can also listen to them uh, if one has a loudspeaker that converts every signal that passes a certain, certain threshold to a sound. So that's what we're going to do now. So just for those who uh, are not familiar with the concept of play cells, I'm not now going to show a video uh, with sound. 
which illustrates a play cell in a rat that is walking in a box that is about one by one meter. It's just chasing food pellets, uh, walking around randomly, and we're going to listen to a play cell um, while the rat is doing that. Okay. I think you got the idea. The place field is up here in the upper right corner. So the cell fires whenever the rat is in that part of the environment and, and not uh, else. Uh, and this is illustrated uh, in the maps to the left here. So these are three different cells. They're shown in two different ways. So the first here is the trajectory of the rat as it's moving around in the box. The black is the way the rat has moved. And each red dot is a position where the cell has fired one spike. So you can see that this cell fires its spikes here in the northwest part. This is color-coded here, so blue is uh, no activity, red is high activity. Here's another cell, here's a third cell. And actually, if you record tens or hundreds of cells, you will see that these cells uh, cover the whole environment together. And uh, you will also see that most of the principal cells in the hippocampus actually are place cells. So that was why uh, O'Keefe, together with Lynn Nadel, suggested that the hippocampus is actually uh, the implementation of Tolman's cognitive map. So this was in 1978. So since then, uh, people have asked uh, naturally, where do these signals arise? Where do they come from? And that uh, was still um, a much debated question when uh, we came into the field. That was uh, at the end of the uh, 1990s. So the first question that my lab uh, worked on was um, the origin of uh, place cells in CA1. So there are um, the most, there are at least two ways that signals can come into CA1. This is CA1 here. And you can also see this is the hippocampus, so the overlying cortex is removed. Uh, this is a rat brain. And then uh, you see a, a section through the hippocampus. Signals come in from here. This is from entorhinal cortex, go into uh, several subfields. One is dente gyrus here, CA3 here, CA1 here. <laughs> and then uh, it usually goes back to, uh, to the uh, entorhinal cortex. And you have the subiculum in between. So uh, this circuit of synapses is more or less one way and uh, has been referred to as a trisynaptic uh, circuit uh, when it was uh, described by uh, my former supervisor, Per Andersen, in 1971 um, and has long been considered as a classical route of information flow through the hippocampus. So the obvious thing to start with would be to remove uh, one part of the loop so signals coming in here with the blue, dente gyrus, CA3, and CA1, going back to entorhinal cortex. Um, so we removed CA3 and then asked, what happens then to the place cells in CA1? Can they be maintained? Well, an obvious prediction is that if the place signal is created in the hippocampus, as was thought at that time, then uh, it should be totally disrupted. This is what uh, we observed. This was in 2002. Uh, lesions of CA3, you can see them here. And then recordings in CA1 here, at where the arrow, arrowhead is. And this is the result. So you can see that so this is a cell that was followed for five days. And you can see that uh, although perhaps it's a bit more blurred than it used to be, it's not much, and uh, the play signal is still there, which means that because these lesions were quite substantial uh, and there was no remaining input from CA3, the only conclusion we could make is that either the play signal is created within CA1 
which was rather unlikely because it has uh, rather limited intrinsic uh, excitatory circuitry, or it comes from the outside, and outside means entorhinal cortex. So for that reason, uh, the next step uh, was to record in entorhinal cortex, and then in 2004 we did so, and recorded in the dorsolateral part of entorhinal cortex, which is a, the part of uh, medial entorhinal cortex which projects uh, to the dorsal hippocampus, where the play cells had been recorded for many, many years. And then we made three observations. So uh, the first is that there is spatial activity. So now you see the same type of maps again as for the play cells. Rat is running in the black and the red is the firing locations and this is a color-coded color map. And you can see that there is clearly spatial activity. So the cells are active only when the rat is at certain positions. The second thing you can see is that uh, there is no longer one peak, there are multiple peaks. Each cell has many firing locations. And the third thing that you may observe is that actually those firing locations are not randomly distributed. They are as far apart from each other as you can get them. So as you see, there is some regularity in the distance between the firing fields. They tend to be as far away from each other as it possible. So, uh, because this wasn't quite clear from this study yet, the next step was to uh, record in a bigger environment so we could see the pattern more clearly. And then that uh, led to uh, the concept of grid cells. Uh, and the reason is that uh, the entorhinal cortex, then we found that many, many of the cells of the entorhinal cortex actually um, have these multiple firing locations that are, uh, that are, dis uh, are located in a strictly hexagonal pattern across the firing environment. So you see that very clearly here. This is the, the color-coded map. So it's uh, so this is a space of, uh, it's a circle of two meters diameter where the rat is walking around. And you can see that uh, it's uh, built up of equilateral triangles that sort of repeat all over uh, the environment. And the uh, same if you have a different type of environment. This is a square box. And you can, oops, sorry. You can see that uh, the, it is a hexagonal pattern of firing locations that repeats all over all the time which happens in, uh, in a large, large fraction of the cells of the entorhinal cortex. And uh, this is just yet another example here. So uh, each blue dot shows a firing location, and this is a box where a rat walks around. This is a, about one and a half meter uh, um, side length box. And what this perhaps was to us most amazing was that these firing locations were maintained at this exactly the same place all the time, regardless of the rat's speed and direction. So when the rat came from a different direction or at a different speed, it always fired exactly at the same spot, forming this hexagonal grid all over the environment all the time. Which means that these cells must either be part of the mechanism that sort of generates a map of the environment based on the rat's own movement, or it must be at least be responsive to such a system that can use uh, the animal's speed and the animal's direction and online sort of compute a representation in the brain of where the animal is at any given time. And this, as you can see, is pretty precise because uh, the distance across one of these nodes is no more than five or ten centimeters, maybe, in the smallest scale. So that led to the idea that these cells perhaps are part of uh, the brain's mechanism or for path integration or a system that the brain uses to encode relationships between uh, places in the environment in a way that is independent of the particular landmarks that we see around in the environment, but simply uses the rat's own uh, movements and then would be quite effective even in landscapes like this where there is no um, cues around to help the animal find its uh, location. So then I will um, briefly touch on five uh, um, small uh, 
five uh, issues that uh, I think are important to uh, know about these grid cells. And I will begin with uh, the uh, anatomical organization of these map of grid cells. The question is then, how are the grid cells distributed or organized in the entorhinal cortex? Because you can at least think of three, you can think of more actually, but there are at least three different ways that grid cells may uh, differ from each other. The first is the spatial phase, and by the spatial phase we simply mean how are different cells shifted relative to each other in terms of their firing uh, locations. I mean, how are they located in the XY plane? Is one shifted to the right relative to another cell or, to the, or, or up or so, and so on. The other parameter is the spatial frequency. So how uh, large are these uh, uh, firing fields? And, uh, and what is the distance between them? So we can also uh, call it spacing, which is the inverse of the frequency. And the final is the spatial orientation, or how is the grid tilted relative to uh, any arbitrary reference line in the environment. Okay, so this is uh, again the, tra uh, the trajectory, the rate map, and this is the autocorrelation is just uh, another way of plotting uh, the relationship between places in uh, the environment. What is one M? Sorry? Oh, one so meter. yeah, one meter. It's a scale. Yeah, thanks. So you see that uh, for the autocorrelation map, the scale is half, and that's uh, so um, it's just for space reasons. Yeah. So then to the first question, how about the spatial f phase? Um, it was pretty clear from the first recordings that whenever we recorded uh, cells uh, simultaneously, um, yeah, can you see or? Well, but I have I have a second one here, so I think it's. Okay, so um, you uh, can see these are three different cells. So one is uh, shown in blue, one in uh, red, and one in green, and they are just plotted on top of each other. So these are recorded from, uh, from the same place in the entorhinal cortex. And what you can see is that uh, they actually already were three cells. The whole environment is more or less covered. And this is shown here. This shows the peak firing locations. And if you shift them relative to each other, you can make them lie on top of each other. So you see already now that they have a common spacing or spatial frequency and they have a common orientation. So um, how about then about the scale? Well, the scale seems actually to be quite topographical in the sense that if you record from uh, a given place in the entorhinal cortex, like here at the absolute uh, dorsal end at the top, then what you find is that all those cells that you record there have a very, very similar uh, spacing or spatial frequency. So you can see the distance between the peaks here is the same for all of the cells. So this is one cell, second cell, third cell, fourth cell. Uh, if you record from another location, which is far deeper into the brain, here it's about a millimeter below this position, now you can see that the distance is much larger, but that is the case for all of the cells recorded here at uh, any given time. So it's like blowing a balloon up, and certainly you have the distances uh, for all of the cells much, uh, is much wider. So, and this uh, can then be shown here. This is uh, recordings from several rats. So this is distance from the border, dorsal border of the entorhinal cortex. And this is the spacing, the distance between fields, and you can see that it increases approximately linearly, at least across rats, as you go from dorsal and further ventral. But now this is only about 25% of the entorhinal uh, dorsal ventral axis. So we started about here, <coughs> stop around here, and the entorhinal cortex actually goes all the way down here. So what happens if we go further? Now we are in the middle, about 50%. And you can't see any grid any longer because now things, uh, the fields, you can imagine that these are just big fields that uh, are part of a grid and you only see one field. But how can we know? And it's even worse if you go really deep down here, then uh, you can't see, you can't tell if it's just one big field that is so big that you can't see anything at all. So the only way to test that would be to have a big lab 
and that's not easy to get. So, uh, but we have uh, got one, um, one type of apparatus which made it possible to test this. So this is an 18 meter long linear track. Rat is running from one end to the other, back and forth, about 10 times per day, which is something they really like. And uh, what they get at the ends is uh, food. So here, and another food piece here, and that makes them run back and forth many times. Um, and on such a big uh, linear track, it is possible to uh, ask if uh, actually there are grids also for larger environments. Okay, now it c comes to the end. <laughs> Okay, so this is the result, and uh, now we are plotting it linearly. So this is distance from zero to 18 meters. Each line is one run, and each tick here is uh, a spike. So this is, uh, rat is running back and forth like this, and uh, the pink ones, or the purple ones, is uh, left to right runs, and the blue ones are right to left runs. So what you can see is that there is some regularity, so periodicity even now. So this is in the dorsal part, um, which we already know. So this is not, maybe not so surprising. Uh, this is dorsal to intermediate. So now the distance is already two, more than two meters between each peak. And uh, finally, if we go to the almost ventral part, we can uh, get uh, cells. This is still not at the end. This is about 75% down. You can get dis distances that are three, four meters at least. So um, that uh, makes some interesting uh, suggestions. Because we know from the anatomy that uh, grid cells in the entorhinal cortex uh, are likely to converge. Grid cells with different spacing, so different spatial frequency, are likely to converge on the same cells in the hippocampus, so that in the dorsal hippocampus, you will get convergence from grid cells with very tight uh, grids and somewhat less tight grids. In the ventral ones, you will, get, uh, you will have cells that get convergence from uh, cells that um, have a wider spacing, but still quite a wide range. And then uh, it's possible to imagine that simply by some linear summation of these signals, you will actually get a signal that has one firing location, which is the place cell. So this is illustrated here. This is uh, just in one dimension. But uh, the idea is if you, have, uh, uh, if you have waves of slightly different frequency and sum them up, you will get one, and they are aligned in the middle. You will get one peak in the middle. And then by applying some inhibition, you can sort of get the signal that, is, uh, that is, uh, has the properties of a place uh, cell in the hippocampus. This? Oh yes, yes, that's right, and uh, uh, that is a property of uh, of uh, both grid cells and place cells. So in, pl in place cells in the hippocampus, it's called remapping. So when a rat goes two di different directions, the maps are actually quite independent. So it's as if when the rat comes to the end, it switches off one map and gets another map for that. Direction. If you record in entorhinal cortex, you, you have the same grid cells being active all the time. Uh, but what, if you compare their properties, they are totally differently aligned. So, uh, for example, the, um, uh, they may, the grid cells that have fields at certain places in one direction will be shifted when the rats go in the other direction. And sometimes they are even oriented slightly differently as well. So it's two different maps. Okay. So how does it know that a, so, how, so there is no general knowledge about here. It depends if I come from the left, let's say, then I know that this is a place. And if I come from the right, then I'm not sure that it's the same place that I would be if I would come from the other direction. Yeah. No, I, I think in, in principle you're right. The first time you, you may not know that it is the same place. But what happens, uh, I believe, is that uh, the, the grid cell system doesn't operate on its own. It uses the hippocampus. And I think part of the reason why you have a, a hippocampus is that you can store all the landmarks or events that are associated with places 
and then they are learned, and then after a while you can actually maybe match them. Yeah. All right. Um, so then, um, just in agreement with this model, uh, this is actually what you see in the hippocampus. So again, you have also there an increase in the size of the place fields, going from a very sharp, less than half a meter in the dorsal hippocampus to three, four meters in the, in the middle and up to about 10 meters maybe at the very ventral end. Okay, so, um, uh, and uh, another implication is then that if you have a convergence of cell, grid cells with different spacing onto a common cell, uh, it should also be possible to read out uh, actually where in the environment the rat is. Uh, something you couldn't done, do if you had information only from one cell or if all cells had the same uh, firing locations because then it would always be ambiguous about where the rat is. But if you have this convergence, you can tell where the rat is. And this is shown here. This is just feeding the signals from, from uh, eight cells into a computer. And uh, then the cross is the location of the rat and the blue is the guess of the computer about uh, where the rat is. So it's actually possible to, to uh, make some uh, reasonably good guesses about where the rat is in the environment as it move, moves around. Of course, with eight cells you can, you can probably do more <laughs> if you have more cells, but uh, it illustrates just the principle that it is unambiguous about the rats in their position in the environment. So now I may have given you the impression that uh, entorhinal cortex actually is uh, only grid cells, and so that's definitely not the case. So entorhinal cortex also contains other cells, uh, and uh, the first type is actually a cell that was discovered uh, uh, quite a while ago, in 1985, by Jim Rank in New York, um, who showed that, uh, that uh, cells in uh, the presubiculum uh, which is another part of the parahippocampal cortex, uh, have the uh, fire uh, very uh, regularly when the rat is uh, pointing its head in a certain direction in the room, and only then, never else. So these were called uh, head direction cells, and the idea is shown here. If you see this little graph up here, this uh, po is a polar plot, and if you focus on the white curve, this is uh, the firing rate of the cell. So whenever the rat had its head pointing in the northeast direction in the, uh, relative to the room, uh, the cell was very active. So I'm going to show a cell. Um, you'll see the rat walking around in a big circle. And this is the head uh, direction of the cell. And uh, it's a bit difficult because this goes so fast. But uh, you may notice that whenever the rat, uh, whenever the arrow pi is up here, in the northeast direction, the cell is active, and that's it. <coughs> so such cells exist also in the entorhinal cortex. So um, in the entorhinal cortex, uh, it's the same type. This cell fires whenever the rat's head is in the east, in the west direction, and uh, you can see that it has no grid pattern or anything, any place pattern. Uh, and this is another cell that, from two different trials, fires only when the rat is pointing its head in the northwest direction. So these, um, the, the grid cells are actually in the deeper layers and in the intermediate layers of the entorhinal cortex. They are mixed with the uh, uh, head direction cells. And in addition, you actually have other cells too that fire both in response to uh, head direction and have a grid uh, pattern. So these are conjunctive uh, cells that uh, are sort of conditional grid cells. You see they have this grid pattern here but uh, they fire only when the rat's head is pointing in a certain direction. So for this cell, only when the head is pointing in southwest, and for this cell, only in the southeast direction. So the, these cells uh, exist together. And uh, in addition, there's actually a fourth type of cell, um, which uh, responds to the local geometric borders of the environment. So the, the rat is walking in this box again, Red is high firing rate, and you can see that this cell fires along that wall, and that's it. If you stretch the box, it still fires along that wall. If you stretch the box in the other direction, it still keeps firing along all that wall. And uh, if you do this in a different room, you'll see the same. 
if you introduce, here's another cell where they're firing on the, on the west side. If you introduce a wall here, you get firing also along that wall. So this cell really likes uh, uh, walls to the left. Uh, so these cells, uh, we don't know exactly what their function is, but it's easy to imagine that somehow these may be involved in anchoring the grid cells uh, to the boundaries of the environment. For example, when the rat is running back and forth on the linear track, that uh, there may be cells that sort of say that here, uh, this is the start and this is the end. So together, these different types of cells uh, all located together in the same network in the medial entorhinal cortex may perhaps be part of the map, uh, rat's internal map of where it is in the environment. So you have distance encoded in the grid cells. You have direction, well, which is also actually in the grid cells. So you have head direction cells and you have uh, this boundary or border cells. So all this is put together by mechanisms that we don't know. But what we do know is still that uh, this is uh, strictly related or strictly dependent on the rat's own motion in the environment because uh, it can, is able to correct for any deviations in direction and distance that uh, the rat is uh, making as it moves around. So, uh, what are the mechanisms? Uh, this is obviously a question that I can't really uh, uh, address very well, but it's possible to make a beginning. Many models have been suggested. I'm not going to, uh, to introduce any of them here, but I'll rather start from the other side and uh, discuss what are the constraints. So, um, and we can begin by asking um, what network architectures, what cell types, are able to support grid cell firing and uh, direction firing. So far, I've said that grid cells exist in medial and terrinal cortex and head direction cells exist in the presubiculum. But is that the entire truth? No, that's wrong. So uh, this is uh, the wider network of the parahippocampal cortex. So this is the presubiculum, the parasubiculum, which have heavy inputs to the medial entorhinal cortex, which goes through the hippocampus and then it goes back. So it's a kind of extended loop. This is uh, the hippocampus in yellow, and then you have presubiculum in blue, a parasubiculum in uh, pink, and then the medial entorhinal cortex in uh, the entorhinal cortex in uh, uh, green. So if we now record activity from the presubiculum where the head direction cells were found, what actually turns out is that, uh, uh, is that uh, these are the recording uh, locations, is that there are these head direction cells firing when, in this case, the rat's head is pointing in the northwest direction and no particular firing uh, preference. But there are also other types of cells like this cell, which is a, a relatively standard grid cell or a conjunctive grid cell, grid by head direction cells. So they have a grid pattern, but only in when the rat is pointing in a certain direction. Or you have cells that have activity that uh, looks a bit more like border cells. And these can, this can be quantified. So this is not just single examples. So you can count the number of occurrences of such cells. And uh, the way to do that uh, might be, or at least one way to do it is to to uh, compare with a shuffle distribution where you simply take these firing rate maps and you move every spike a certain number of uh, seconds uh, backward or forward in time. You make your rate map, you calculate uh, your uh, scores for uh, grid cells or for head direction cells or for border cells. And then you, from the shuffle distribution, you define the, you find the 95th percentile and then compare with the observed distribution and what you see is that the number of, uh, of cells with um, properties uh, with uh, grid scores, which is a symmetry based score, that are above that chance level is quite large even in the curriculum. <laughs> the same holds of course for, uh, for cells that have a directional measure, so this is a measure of directionality and again, you can see that's a lot above chance, and also the board cells are above chance level. The same happens in parasubiculums, which is another component of the network, so I don't have to repeat it. You just see all the different cell types there as well. And you see that quantitatively here again. So grid cells, head direction cells, border cells, 
which is the same as in the medial entorhinal cortex, which uh, where we started, but you also have these uh, different types of cells, so the directional cells, grid cells, conjunctive cells, border cells. And uh, this is the distributions for entorhinal cortex, so they don't look that much different from pre- and parasubiculum. So this is the grid cells, of course a lot of grid cells here, compared to chance, and a lot of head direction cells, and also more border cells than expected by chance. But the border cells are much more rare. So. And in entorhinal cortex, there's another feature, which, uh, is, which is that it's actually quite dependent on the recording layer, so the layer two of uh, entorhinal cortex, uh, of the medial entorhinal cortex, has a lot of grid cells. And these grid cells are highly non-directional in most cases, uh, which is different from the deeper layers where you have uh, also a lot of grid cells, but then they tend to get very directional. So this is layer three, and even more in layer five, you have fewer grid cells, but really a lot of head direction cells. So what does this tell us? Well, it at least tells us that in three types of uh, uh, brain networks, the pre-subiculum, the parasubiculum, and the entorhinal cortex, there are the same cell types. So that means that this uh, type of firing must be uh, sustained by networks and cell types that are quite different. So one way to start to find the mechanisms could then simply be to um, look for the common properties. Now, unfortunately, we don't know much about those common properties yet, so there is clearly some work to be done, but um, it at least points to a place to start. And one of the places where one could start is the degree to which the different types of cells exhibit theta modulation. A theta modulation, theta is a brain rhythm at, at around 8 hertz, and uh, most cells in the entorhinal cortex and hippocampus actually exhibit quite strong theta modulation, which you can see here for a grid cell, for a head direction cell, and for a border cell. So this can be quantified, and what you find is that there is uh, a strong tendency for grid cells to actually have strong theta modulation. And to some extent also for head direction cells and border cells. But if you compare the different areas, like here, you start by layer two of entorhinal cortex here, go to layer three, layer five, and layer six, and then to parasubiculum, and then to presubiculum, you actually see that there is a slight decline of grid uh, scores, grid activity, which is uh, uh, paralleled by decline in degree of theta activity, which might point to a possible link between uh, theta activity and grid cell, but of course this is only a correlation and nothing more. And this is definitely not related to the directional correlate, which is uh, apparently independent of theta activity. So then the second last point, uh, which I'm going to mention, how, how much more should I talk? You have, you have ten, or five minutes. Mm, 10 or 5 minutes, okay. So um, then I think um, Go on, yeah, well, let's, let's take, uh, I, I make two points more. So uh, the fourth point here is um, uh, about the development of the spatial map. So is this something that's innate? And then we can go far back in history, all, all the way to Immanuel Kant, for example, who suggested uh, that uh, we are actually born with uh, uh, an a priori way of perceiving the world in space and time. So... Uh, uh, to just brought us to uh, the question of whether this grid and place map actually is also innate in the sense that it's already there the first time the animal starts exploring the outer world. So uh, to address that, we recorded electrodes in, uh, uh, the, in the brain of uh, young rats at P15 just one day after they opened their eyes. And they, this is a time when they start walking around outside the nest for the first time. So the first finding was that head direction cells are definitely there from the beginning. So you can see those, these are exa individual examples, cells that fire only when the head is pointing in one direction, when the rat uh, moves around outside the nest for the very first time. This is only a uh, few hours after it opened its eyes. And uh, this shows that these head direction cells are actually also very stable. So you can see that these are two different recordings. 
and there's very little difference in the preferred direction of each cell. When it comes to place cells, they are actually also uh, present early on. So at least from P17, they are pretty uh, clearly there. And then there's not much development across days from P21 up to P34 when we stopped recording. And this is an adult rat. So there is a little bit of development, uh, which you can see here, for example, in the stability of the cells, but uh, and maybe a slight increase in the number of place cells. It is really not a lot. And finally, the grid cells are actually appear to be the slowest to mature. And um, you can see that here. So this is at P16. There are rudiments of grid cells already at that age. So you can see sort of triangular, equilateral triangular patterns. But they don't really form into uh, clearly hexagonal structures uh, until around P28, which you is when you, in the autocorrelation maps, can start seeing quite a regular structure. Here it's quite messy. Um, and if you quantify this, and again use the same approach, you find that the number of cells that cross the chance level, uh, the chance level here is 5, uh, and 10 is what you would uh, expect. Uh, this is a significance limit. And you can see that the number of cells that pass that threshold is above uh, that level at that young age. But the sharpness of the grid, or the periodicity of the grid, actually increases quite a lot and comes, uh, reaches adult levels only at about four weeks of age, which is slower than the place cells and the head direction cells. So um, to ask what's going on here, one of the things we did was to, uh, so this is uh, from a postdoc who worked with Henry Markram, and he recorded uh, activity from uh, uh, four cells at the same time with whole cell patch clamp recording and uh, studied uh, the spontaneous activity of uh, three, uh, triplets or quadruples of cells. And the brief message I'll make here is that when you go from day 18 to day 25, you actually see a clear increase in the synchrony of those cells. So at 18, when you have uh, fluctuations in the membrane potential, they tend to be pretty discoordinated. But when you go to P25, if you have uh, a, a slight uh, hyperpolarization or depolarization in one cell, you tend to see it in quite a lot of the other cells as well. This is, this is in vitro? Or in, in vitro, sorry. Yeah, I forgot to mention that. This is slices of entorhinal cortex. So, 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 so how is it? I'm not saying connectivity because uh, I don't think that uh, this is excitatory connections. This is through inhibitory uh, to interneurons, which means that if you have uh, the connectivity or the, uh, of the divergence of interneurons in the entorhinal cortex, like in hippocampus, is ex extensive. So uh, that can account for the synchronized activity or correlations of activity that you see. Uh, which comes up around the mid P20s and perhaps then could be related to the development, the late development in the entorhinal cortex. So, um, that, uh, but that sequence of development raises the possibility that, um, that uh, in the um, entorhinal cortex there is actually, um, there are rudiments of each of the three types of representations, but it seems like the directional one comes first, and then uh, the spatial ones come slightly later, which raise the possibility that uh, the directional map may actually be involved in uh, the formation of uh, the uh, place map uh, and, the, and the grid map, which of course is just a, a suggestion that has to be tested. But, but, but didn't you say that, that uh, in, your, in your earlier model you have to Mm -hmm. to generate the place yep. and here you see the place yep. before you see the grid cells. That's a good point, but remember that uh, the place, the grid cells that you see uh, here, there, there are still, uh, there's clearly spatial activity and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's more than you would expect so by chance. Enough to generate yeah, it's probably place. enough. Yeah. <coughs> okay, and then in the final uh, point here I'll make is that uh, 
There are actually, uh, as you can imagine, several maps. There is, uh, um, there is the grid map, as I've told uh, you, and there is the place map in the hippocampus. But how do they relate to each other? And I briefly mentioned that the place map in the hippocampus may actually also store information about individual environments. So um, if you now go back to the CA1, where we started out about uh, 10 years ago, and then comp uh, what happens in CA1? CA1 receives signals from the entorhinal cortex, from grid cells and maybe other cells, that project directly in through the direct route here. And it also receives information from, uh, which is presumably stored in the hippocampus. So these converge uh, possibly on the same cells. And uh, the question then is, uh, what is the relationship? When does CA1 listen to one input? And when does it listen to another input? Does that happen at the same time? Or is our CA1 cells in one mode at some time and then in another mode at other times? And this brings us to, uh, to uh, oscillations in the brain, and especially to gamma rhythms, which have been implicated uh, in other brain systems as a way of creating communication windows. So the idea, uh, which is from, I'll, the illustration is from a paper by Wolf Singer, which uh, makes the point uh, pretty uh, directly, in my opinion. If you now compare two brain regions, the blue region and the red region, they have this gamma oscillation here and this one here. And then uh, the probability of highest firing is at the trough here, here, and here, here, and here. So for these uh, brain regions to interact, for the cells here to influence each other, uh, the influence would be much stronger if these cells fire more or less at the same time as those cells, which happens when these are in synchrony. So that's fine. That's one way of creating communication opportunities. But now, if um, you compare with a third region, which has the same rhythm, but it is actually out of phase. Mm -hmm. So now these spikes are spiking at a moment when this region is more or less inhibited. Then the opportunities for interaction are much reduced. So that's a bad phase relation. Mm -hmm. Another way that gamma rhythms would not work is if there is a difference in frequency. So compare the blue one here, for example, with uh, the black one here. So this is slightly faster. And then the number of occurrences with uh, spiking in this area and spiking in this area would be much lower. So the latter causes some kind of problem for the hippocampus because what has been called gamma oscillations in the hippocampus has been shown to actually vary across a really wide window of maybe even 30 to 100 hertz. So you can have rhythms that are relatively slow, like in the 30, 40, 50 hertz region, like here. So these are gamma rhythms. They are riding on top of a slower rhythm that's called the theta rhythm. But now focus on the small ones here. And then you have also what is called gamma rhythms, which is uh, the faster ones here. So riding on the same slow theta rhythm, but you can clearly see that this one is much faster than this. So how, if there are different rhythms in the same system, uh, then it sort of breaks one of the assumptions we tried to make here, namely that uh, to get communication windows between different regions, there has to be reasonably similar frequency. So to try to understand this a little bit better, uh, we recorded um, from uh, three areas, CA1, uh, entorhinal cortex, and CA3. And uh, again, here is uh, the raw traces. This uh, is uh, a cross-frequency diagram. So Laura Colgin, who made those observations, is actually published now. Uh, she uh, uh, made three different findings. So the first one was that there are two bands of gamma rhythm. So this is a cross-frequency diagram showing uh, how um, gamma fre frequencies in the 20 to 60 hertz range and from 80 to 140 actually are linked to the underlying slower theta rhythm. So you can see there are two distinct bands here with a clear gap in between. So it's actually not one gamma rhythm, it's at least two, maybe many more. So that's the first point. The second point is that when those occur, when they're riding on top of the slower theta rhythm, they actually tend to have different phases on the theta. So the slow gamma rhythm 
is, this is the time frequency is histogram, so uh, time frequency representation. So this is time along the theta cycle, this is frequency, and color shows power. So you can see that the slow gamma rhythm tends to be linked at the phase of the theta rhythm when there is most inhibition and slightly afterwards. Fast gamma is at the trough where there's most activity. And the third point, uh, well, and this actually just let me add that these tend to occur usually on different theta cycles. So there's a slow gamma cycle and there's a fast gamma, and only rarely are they on the same uh, theta cycle. And then to the final and most important point, that is what happens when you compare the different brain regions. So let's first compare CA1 and entorhinal cortex. So now, if you look at the blue trace here, that is CA1. This when CA1 has a slow gamma rhythm. You see the slow rhythm like here. If you compare with entorhinal cortex, there's no gamma at all. It's completely silent, uh, at least in this recording. So, but if you now look at fast gamma in CA1, which you show here, you see it's much faster, the blue line here. You can also see that there is fast gamma in entorhinal cortex. Same here, fast gamma in entorhinal in CA1 is accompanied by fast gamma in entorhinal cortex, where the slow gamma has no uh, matching gamma in the entorhinal cortex. So this slow gamma in CA1 is accompanied by slow gamma in CA3. Whereas if you compare uh, the two regions with regard to fast gamma, the blue here is um, CA1, there's little uh, fast gamma in CA3. And same here, a lot of fast gamma in, in CA1, but only little in CA3. Which means that actually when there is slow gamma in uh, CA1, it's linked to slow gamma in CA3. <coughs> so if you now um, compare this, if you, uh, uh, what it actually suggests is that there are windows of slow gamma, there are windows of fast gamma. Whenever there's slow gamma, there's heavy synchronization with CA3. Whenever there's fast gamma, there's heavy synchronization with the grid cell network in entorhinal cortex. And this seems to flip back and forth all the time. And these switches actually occur several times per second, so that, at any, that the CA1 network is actually communicating both with the grid cells in entorhinal cortex and with the place cells, uh, which contain maybe uh, the memories in CA3, uh, several times per second, but going back and forth like this. And uh, in that way, it's almost like multiplexing in a cable. It's actually possible to flip between two representations of the same, namely the online representation of what uh, comes in through the sensors and the stored representation of what is lying. So it's almost like uh, an old-fashioned radio where you can tune in to one frequency and listen to the memories and tune in to a different frequency and listen to what is coming in from the outside. So that will, I'll stop there. But um, I'll make a final point, namely that it is um, possible to, um, to make uh, a test where you can actually um, make uh, rats retrieve memories of places that are not where the rat is in the moment. So uh, Carl Jesek in our lab has developed our test which uh, makes it possible for rats to start in one environment walking around in a box that is, uh, has green lights and is else totally dark and then suddenly a switch uh, turns on some other lights and the green disappears and the rat is suddenly in a place where it used to be uh, on a different location. So it's, it's effectively teleported to a different environment. And uh, as you can imagine, this uh, probably induces some confusion in the rat, which lasts for three to five seconds. It's like when you wake up in a hotel room and you don't know where you are. So we try to capture this initial moment of confusion and uh, actually see what happens in the activity of uh, uh, the C of the um, uh, CA3 area in the hippocampus compared with this is a representation of all the activity in lots of cells in one environment. This is what we call the A environment. And this is of the other, the B environment. And then what we do is that uh, we compare for theta cycle by theta cycle. We correlate the activity with the A environment and the B environment. And what you see is that it, uh, quite often after you switch the environments, the rat flips back and forth between the blue environment, which is the previous one, 
and the red and goes back to the blue and then the red and back to the blue and then finally it stabilizes in the new red environment after about two, three, four seconds. And it's possible then to use, um, to use um, uh, this as a test of actually finding out um, what happens uh, when the rat retrieves the wrong map uh, in this uh, uh, confusing situation. So it's, uh, this is the right map, but then suddenly the wrong one flips in from the environment and it's back to this one. And each window here is one theta cycle. So the brain in the hippocampus is actually jumping back and forth between two representations. And the prediction then is that uh, these, uh, during those moments, the rat is actually uh, maybe be using the low frequency gamma rhythms to retrieve memories from the CA3 network. So that's what we are going to test. We haven't tested that yet, but that's sort of next on the list. And that brings me, I'll jump over the conclusion, but I want to mention that there are lots of people who have, uh, uh, who have uh, contributed and done uh, most of this work. So uh, I'll just mention some. But uh, with uh, the early discovery of grid cells, uh, we worked with uh, Marianne Fien and Torkel Hafting and Sturla Molden. And the border cells were, was with Trygve Sulsta. The pre- and parasubiculum work is not published, but that was with uh, Charlotte Bakara. Karl Jesek had the teleportation, Laura Colgin, the gamma rhythms, <coughs> together with Ole Jensen. And Menno Witter has worked with us on a lot of the anatomical questions. The development was with Ross Langston and Jamie. Anger and, uh, and uh, other people who have contributed to this is uh, Tora Bonnevi, Dora Derdikman, who uh, is from uh, Israel, and uh, my Brit Moser, who is my colleague and uh, with whom I've done uh, all of this work together. A lot of people who have funded this, so I won't bore you with that, but uh, I think then uh, it's time to stop. Thank you very much. Sorry for going over time. It was quite a lot. Yeah. Yeah. My, my question refers to the development of pace. I assume that uh, these threads were green in cages. And my question is how much this would interfere with the development of, of navigation, which in, in Britain would be probably much faster. Yeah, no, that's an uh, interesting question. I can't really give you an answer, but uh, one thing we can say is that even if uh, rats are raised in relatively small cages, the first time they are uh, put in a large environment like the 18-meter track, already right from the beginning they have a representation that can cover all of it. So I think it fits with the idea that uh, much of this is actually wired up even without uh, rats really having to uh, experience particular, particular types of environment. But of course, implicit in your question is a long list of experiments that uh, should be done. What happens if the space is not homogeneous? Say that uh, one part of the uh, room is more complex and the other part of the room is the, the more resolution? Mm -hmm. Well, um, What's, uh, it seems like the, the, the representation of space in the grid cells is pretty resistant to, uh, to many uh, features, local features. So, I mean, if it's non, sort of non-significant features like uh, small objects lying in the room and so on. This has not so much been studied in, place cells, in grid cells, but in place cells it has. And uh, maybe it gets more concentrated and so on, but uh, essentially um, I think the both the grid cell system and the play cell system is more uh, determined, at least primarily, by the rat's movement in the open space. And as long as it can move freely, that uh, is still maintained. So differences may come when there are major changes, like um, some of you may have heard work of Dori Derrickman, who presented his here his uh, hairpin maze where rats make sharp turns. And whenever the rat makes a sharp turn, it's such a big difference that the whole thing resets. But that's a different thing. Then the whole map resets. So it's just like when the rat makes a turn at the end of the linear track. But uh, otherwise, I would say that this is a kind of empty map that the rat can use anywhere and which is relatively insensitive to the landmarks. But in addition, of course, the rat has the hippocampus. And in the hippocampus, it may be possible to encode all the individual properties of environments 
and sort of make individual maps for different places. And, uh, but in the entorhinal cortex, that is a very boring uh, map that sort of just has some standard features which can be used anywhere. And that's probably why it's useful. You can use it anywhere you are. Yeah, yeah I don't know who's there. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty independent in the sense that uh, these cells probably can be driven by a lot of uh, sensory inputs. Obviously, the inputs are important, and I believe especially the uh, the um, the rat's own self motion inputs are important. But then uh, you also have the visual inputs. You have smells, and you have maybe auditory inputs, which all can help the rat uh, to, um, to, to define or to calibrate the position of the map. So the map itself, uh, consisting of grid cells and place self, cells, is probably just uh, a hardwired thing that is determined much by the rat's movement. So the movement de uh, defines where the rat is on that map. But uh, calibrating it relative to the surroundings, for that you can use any kind of uh, of uh, sensory input. And with regard to output to motor behaviors, it is, um, um, I think it's also pretty, uh, you can see it, the same thing with, uh, with uh, for example, fast speeds and low speeds. But there is a question that is not really resolved. Uh, to what extent does actually the scale of the grid change with the uh, uh, speed of the animal? That's still things that we are working on. Um, the ventral hippocampus, yeah, I mean, the way that I presented ventral hippocampus and ventral entorhinal cortex here was um, very brief and schematic. So it may, I may have given the impression that, uh, that ventral hippocampus is also just a spatial network. But uh, as you imply, it receives a lot of input from amygdala and so on. And um, I think actually that fits quite well together because what you have in ventral hippocampus is um, uh, a very large coarse spatial uh, map. So uh, um, it's not so fine-tuned as in the, in the dorsal hippocampus. And uh, it's well possible that the same cells, or at least the same network, also receives a lot of emotional input. And if you think about that, uh, how, how is, in, how is uh, in emotion related to space when you remember it in your brain. Quite often you remember contexts, wide contexts, but you don't, uh, with emotion, if I have an emotional uh, memory of this place, I probably don't distinguish between this location and that location. I remember the whole room. So perhaps um, for emotional inputs, they may be uh, linked to the wide spatial representation that you have in the ventral hippocampus, but perhaps to a lesser extent to the fine detail representation that you have more dorsally. So that's one way of thinking about it. But still, actually, from your point of view, hippocampus is a special map of emotional memory? Um, well, I, I would rather say that space is represented throughout the hippocampus, but space is definitely not the only thing that is represented in the hippocampus. I have a question about the relationship between the grid cells and the places. So if I understood you correctly, the idea is that place cells are a result from, from a sum of inputs from the grid cells. This would be the naive thinking. Now, <coughs> what, when, when you have remapping of the place cells, this would imply that now the same neuron receives input from other grid cells. Mm -hmm. how, does, how do you think that this functional connectivity mm -hmm. change on, on, such, on mm -hmm. such fast? I can only speculate. So two things to say. The first is that, uh, as you say, the model that I show is very simplified. So it goes both ways. That's important to remember. So the place cells feed back to the grid cells. So it's actually a loop. And uh, um, I think they're totally dependent on each other. So the place cells probably represent play individual places, memories, that sort of feed back and maybe even calibrate, contribute to calibrating the grid cell map. But the other question, the relation to remapping or to 
changes between different maps? That is, uh, that is a very important question. It can happen in several ways, but one way that it could happen is that within entorhinal cortex, you may perhaps have modules or grid cells that operate independently. So, because what we know is that uh, when you have remapping in the hippocampus, you get a shift or a reorientation of the whole entorhinal grid map. So maybe the orientation of all cells will uh, flop uh, 30 degrees or whatever from one environment to the other. Uh, but if that was all that happened throughout the entorhinal cortex, maybe all you would see was just a similar rotation in the place cells. However, if now the grid cell map has several modules, one uh, rotates a little bit that way, and the other maybe it doesn't rotate or rotates the other way, then you can get anything. So you may get a total, uh, totally new map. So that's one possible way that you can actually get um, a very stereotyped, rigid map in the entorhinal cortex to, to create a completely new map in the hippocampus. So this shifts the question to the fast remapping. Yeah, I guess this can happen very fast. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Okay, last you, refer, you refer to head movements west, east, north. Literal reference to west no. or left side? No, I, uh, what I mean is, is um, west in the room, but it's not, not related to the magnetic uh, north pole in any way. It's just relative to, so it's something the, the rat has to learn. So it's relative to the walls of the environment. So usually determined much by the geometry of the room. Yeah. So, so for, let, let me ask the, the final question just, just to, that there was a well-known uh, study on the, on the taxi drivers in London, in their hippocampus. Mm -hmm. Growing and making more connections. Are there mm -hmm. taxi drivers in, the, in your rats? In a, in a sense of, of in rich environment that yeah. they expand in some sense their hippocampus. Yes, well, um, yeah, mm -hmm. we haven't uh, studied the effect of extended uh, experience yet, but we are going to do it in relation to the development. I think during development, it may actually change it quite a lot. But then, that said, I would also say that uh, the, the very basic properties, like having grid cells and so on, is probably so basic that I think. Uh, um, you would almost not find a condition where it's not generated because it's present so early uh, without really any experience at all. Mm -hmm. But the, the, we still don't know how much is early experience necessary for really cre creating the sharply periodic uh, patterns that we see. Thank you very much. Uh -huh.